I was 12. I convinced my parents to let me drop out of school and start homeschooling myself. There was a, I'm going to try to condense somehow in two minutes, 10 years. And I should also say, um, I'm fighting a cold, and I may cough up a hairball on stage, or uh, you know, my, my voice might start to go, or I just get very excited talking about things. And if I start talking too fast, and you have no idea what I'm talking about, you're free to just start throwing vegetables at me, or wave at me, or whatever you want to do is fine with me. So in 1999, I started homeschooling. I was bored out of my mind. I uh, thought it'd be fun to make a website. And I started playing around with uh, one of those free web page makers. And uh, I made MuggleNet.com, which ended up becoming the number one Harry Potter site. So MuggleNet was, so there was a couple things that happened that helped MuggleNet grow as, as quickly as it did. The first thing was not very glamorous, but it's what actually happened. I grinded. I emailed thousands of other Harry Potter webmasters because I said, well, how do I get people to come to my site? I got to get people linking to my site. So that was the first thing. People started coming to the site. Then I had all these people contributing stuff, contributing content. And I thought, well, these people are, you know, this person's a really good graphic designer. This person's a really good uh, developer. I should come recruit them to come help me. So I started building up a team. Without really realizing what I was doing, I was applying basic management science to what was otherwise a very primitive fandom. And I ended up uh, managing a team of about 120 uh, part paid, part volunteer contributors. MuggleNet, at its peak, did about 50 million monthly page views. Uh, I was able to get to wear a lot of different hats and get a lot of crazy awesome experience, uh, including uh, we, uh, we got to go to all the sets of the movies, the, the red carpet premieres. Um, <clears throat> in Oak Park, actually, the, uh, in, when Book 7 came out in 2007, uh, the night that it came out, uh, we were able to speak in front of a crowd of 10,000 people. I also got a call uh, one day uh, when I was a teenager, out of the blue, from J.K. Rowling. Uh, it was, uh, it, and it changed my life. It was actually my dad came bursting in my room with a, a panicked look on his face, and he had a phone in his hand. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. And he was like, Emerson, it's Joe. <laughs> and I'm thinking, OK, why is some guy named Joe <laughs> calling me at 8 o'clock in the morning? So he hands me the phone. I'd just woken up, so <clears throat> sounded like Barry White. <clears throat> Hello? Hello, Emerson. This is Joe. So I played it cool. I said, Joe, let me check my schedule. Maybe I can fit you in. Uh, no, she's just the coolest, most awesome, down-to-earth person. She wanted me to come to her house in Scotland to interview her on the day of the release of the sixth book. So, I, and I was supposed to represent the fandom. So, no pressure. <laughs> um, she's, she's awesome. She's worthy of all the respect and admiration that has been heaped upon her. Uh, we published three books. One of them was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, we got to go on these crazy, awesome uh, road trips, uh, book tours. We had what was, for a time, the number one podcast in the entire world, MuggleCast. And uh, got to do a lot of media. Since J.K. Rowling doesn't go out in public very often, uh, I was kind of that, you know, whenever a journalist had to do a story in Harry Potter, like, oh, let's call that kid who made that website. So uh, one particularly memorable example, uh, I, I totally trolled Geraldo. <laughs> in a totally immature way. I, I don't even know what I was thinking. It worked. I, I don't have time to show the video, but it was totally immature and ridiculous, but it worked. So much so that Jimmy Kimmel actually saw fit to then uh, in the next episode, the next day, Jimmy Kimmel did a segment where he had somebody act like me. And it, it, you know, <laughs> moving on. <clears throat> so let me go back to my childhood. So when I was homeschooled, um, I, I had a, uh, I had awesome parents, awesome parents. The fact that they let me do it in the first place, uh, they had, they had a few rules. Um, one of them was that my brother and I, Dylan, had to read four, success, uh, four biographies of successful people every single day. What I did, my, my days were kind of split up into three things. I spent a lot of time working on MuggleNet. I had tons of free time. I played a lot of sports. I, I played every sport competitively at some point in my life. And I read thousands of books. I was always just naturally inquisitive, fascinated. I wanted to learn everything there was to learn about the world. So. I had an epiphany. Uh, I don't remember exactly how old I was, but not, not long after I started MuggleNet, where with all these biographies, 
And with the success that I had with MuggleNet, I, I had this awakening and I said, if I can do this and I'm this age, imagine what I can do when I'm 16. <laughs> and I realized that with these biographies, you know, you know that, that old saying, you, know, you, uh, you lay down with dogs, you get fleas, or show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Well, in my situation, I, since I was spending so much time reading about the lives of successful people, I started learning how to emulate those patterns. So uh, I, uh, I realized that I needed to do something big. I, I, you know, I was making plenty of money. I had amazing friends, great friendship. I, I got hit by the lucky stick. And I, I kind of thought, well, I'm done. Like, I don't really need anything more to make me happy. So now it's just time to focus on helping other people have the same kind of opportunities that I had. So I said, I want to change the world. And I want to do it on a massive scale. How do I do that? Well, I need to figure out, I need to study people who have already changed the world. These biographies taught me that if you study people who have already figured it out, you'll get there a lot quicker. Trial and error sucks. Trial and error should be the last thing you do. If there's people who already figured it out and you're not doing exactly what, what, what they do, then you're wasting your time. So I, I, started coming with, I started saying, okay, if you want to change the world the biggest scale possible, how do you do that? Well, I realized you have to be really influential. Yeah, there's some people who start from the bottom and they just throw stones at the top and they change things, but let's be honest here. There's a very small number of people who are ruling the world. There's a very small number of people who make most of the decisions that matter. So I started studying influence. I want to know how do you become influential enough to do that. And I started creating this theory. You know, there's uh, social capital, intellectual capital, and monetary capital. Those are the three things you need. The more of those you have, the more influence you have. So when I was at Notre Dame, at one point I, I got bored. And I actually went for fun. It sounded fun to me. And I wanted to drop out and start another company. And I said, wait, I've got a really unique opportunity here. If I want to... If I, want to come, if I want to start my next company, I don't want to spend 20 years learning things the hard way. I want to go from zero to 60 right away. How do I do that? Well, I need to condense decades of experience into the shortest period of time possible. How do I do that? I need to learn vicariously through other people's experiences. I knew through my previous studies of neuroscience that your brain cannot tell the difference between something you vividly imagine and something you actually experience. So I was a, I'm a speed reader, and I set a goal of reading one nonfiction book every single day until graduation. Business, politics, psychology, economics, technology, everything. I wanted to go as broad as possible so I'd be able to connect dots between different industries, disciplines, etc. It wasn't just books. It was SEC filings, 10Ks, research, abstracts. I did a, a systematic analysis of 60 different industries from natural gas wholesaling to drywall contracting, wanting to see patterns. I figured successful people do the same things. They have the same behavior, same attitudes. I want to figure out what, this, what the parallels are in business. So reading was part of it. The other part was reviewed. I reviewed everything that I wanted to remember on a schedule of a day later, a week later, a month later, and then every six months in perpetuity. And then the third part. So I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with the 10,000 hours theory of excellence. Like if you want to get to the top in your field, you have to put in 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. But how do you do that in business without taking you know, decades to, to get that kind of practice? Again, going back to that neuroscientific principle, your brain can't tell the difference between something you vividly imagine and something you actually experience. So I said, all right, here's what I did. I organized all the information into frameworks to contextualize it. I synthesized the best ideas down into mnemonic devices, like acronyms, and then I practiced applying those strategies, techniques, tactics, and situations where it'd be relevant. So for example, I'd have a persuasion framework, a negotiation framework, an innovation framework, and I would take, go th negotiation, go through a dozen books on the subject, take the 15 best ideas, put them into an acronym, and then replay past negotiations in my head using those strategies. Play fictional negotiations in my head using those strategies. Same thing I did when I was an athlete. I would shoot 1,000 free throws in a day, and you, know, you get that many reps at the line, and you step up to the, plate, you know, step up to the line in a game, and you're much more likely to execute uh, flawlessly. So that was the kind of practice I wanted to get. Again, I wanted to go 0 to 60 as soon as I, I started my next, uh, next venture. This is 0 to 60. This is a uh, growth chart showing our traffic since uh, we launched the company. So uh, two weeks after graduation, I co-founded with my now wife, Gabby, a website called Gives Me Hope. And Gives Me Hope, uh, one thing you're going to see as you see some of our sites, you're going to be thinking in your head, oh, I didn't know you guys made that site. That's a common reaction here. So an example from Gives Me Hope, a site where people can share uplifting, inspiring stories. and. Uh, I, at this point, actually, I want to take a minute to, uh, to thank a few people. So tonight, I'm lucky enough to be graced with uh, my family and my other family, all my, my peeps from Sparts Media. And I would like you all to stand up really quickly, please, really, really quickly. And I would just like to say thank you so much. So these guys make me look really good. I get all the credit. It's not fair at all. When, when things are going bad, I get the credit too, which kind of sucks. But when things are going great, I get all the credit. And, and, uh, and I, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for all that you guys have done for me. So 
uh, some more of the sites that we've got, some of the ones you might be familiar with. OMG Facts, the number one fact site online. Uh, we have a, a funny iPhone autocorrect site. I'm sure you guys have definitely seen this content going around the internet. Um, some, some meme sites. Uh, we have a, a funny Rage comic site. I'm sure you've seen this kind of content around the internet too. We've got a uh, secret site where people can share their secrets. Uh, you've seen these demotivational posters. And uh, we're also, I'm also uh, one of the co-founders and, uh, and very active advisors in a, a local startup here called Social Crunch. And I'm going to be super vague and mysterious about this, but it's going to be, from a, from a viral perspective, which I'm going to start nerding out in a bit about, it's going to be awesome. Now we're going to talk virality. And this is the point where I, get, I will probably get so excited that I will talk too fast. And I'll start stringing multiple, multi-syllabic words together, and I won't make any sense. So uh, people come to me all the time. Like, they want to make viral videos. This is going to be really depressing. You want to make a viral video? Don't. Don't. Don't even try. It is too hard. It is way too hard. Let me give you some numbers to show you how hard it is. The content on our sites, uh, we, let's say our audience creates, freeze the math, 40,000 pieces of content per week. We have learned a lot about how to increase the probability of getting content to go viral, and we get one. One of those 40,000 pieces of content to go viral per week, on average. Now, when I say viral, I also mean you know, millions of people viewing it viral. Um, <laughs> So very, very briefly, uh, the, way, the reason I got interested in virality in the first place was because I started off studying influence. So OK, I need to be as influential as possible to make the biggest impact in the world I want to have possible. By the way, that impact I'm talking about, it doesn't mean I want to go work in a soup kitchen for the rest of my life. Impact, business is impact. Entrepreneurship is impact. Entrepreneurship is one of the rare fields. There's other fields where this exists too, but you can have your cake and eat it too. You can kick ass, make tons of money, and you can still make the world a better place. And that's awesome. If I didn't want to do that, I would have just been a hedge fund manager or something like that, because that does sound fun, really. I still think there's probably no greater return on intellectual capital than managing money via hedge fund. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> anyway, so I started setting influence, and then I was really interested in persuasion, and then that led me to virality. And virality was like this awesome, giant, untapped ocean. Like, wow, nobody's researching this, but everybody's fascinated by it. And since there wasn't really any research out there, I decided to start testing things. So uh, in short, viral coefficient, something you need to know. If the viral coefficient is above one, that's when you start getting exponential growth. There's ways you can increase the viral coefficient. Viral coefficient just means for every one person who sees it, how many people do they bring with them? How many people do they refer? So above one means, on average, they refer more than one person for every person who sees it. So uh, first, we're going to do something interactive. This fact right here on OMG Facts, lots and lots and lots of shares, 713,000 shares. Try it with me. You can't hum while holding your nose closed. Try it. Try it right now. <laughs> Simple, short, sweet, massively viral. So if I had to summarize everything that I've learned about virality into one idea, it's this. The more incentive you give people to share, the more likely they are to share. Now, that sounds like one of those really obvious things, and, uh, you know, and you're probably thinking, well, OK, duh. But it's one of those things, if you really think about it, you think about the implications of it, there's, there's much more to it than that. So there's two basic strategies you can get people to, to share. Ultimately, virality is just word of mouth marketing, but the online version of it. The first strategy, this is the strategy I tell everyone to use, bribery. It's the most effective strategy. It's really straightforward. You give somebody something in return for doing something you want. So here's a couple tactics that you can use. You can use these if you have web-related businesses or not. You can start using these right away. Tactic, leave a trail, build virality in. This is simple. Make your product loud so that when other people are using it, other people can see it. Best examples would be like New York Times comes in this bright blue packaging. So every time the, the boy goes down the yard throwing the newspapers in people's yards, they see these bright blue packages. And everyone knows that that person subscribes to the New York Times. IMAX, with the fancy colors back in the 90s, another good example. Hotmail. Hotmail went viral because uh, one of the VCs had the idea, like, hey, why don't you put in their signature and get your free email address at hotmail.com. Boom, viral. Social Cam. Social Cam is just this awesome case study and how to like, use viral principles. Social Cam basically used these viral strategies into, they end up selling the company for $60 million like a year after they launched. I mean, ridiculous. Uh, Social Cam just jam packed that app with all kinds of viral content. And yes, they spammed people on Facebook and did all kinds of things, but it seemed to work out for them. Another tactic content hiding. So again, like, you can give all your content for free, but you, you, you know, if you put up a gate, people will, some people will convert. An example of this would be Warrior Dash. So if you do Warrior Dash, it's like a running series, and you want to see your score, they make you like their page on Facebook. You know, some people say, well, I don't want to do that, but it's worth testing, because you don't know like, what kind of content people will actually like you, and then you can market to them for, for a long period afterwards. Um, discounts, coupons, one-for-ones, donations, this is another straightforward way. You want people to, to, to share your stuff or to refer people? Give them something in return for it. Uh, as an example of this, uh, I, just to test out a theory I had a while ago, um, tweeted out a link saying, I'll donate a penny for every retweet that this tweet gets. Uh, this was after, after Haiti. 
And that tweet, just you know, not even seeded from large Twitter accounts, got 14,000 retweets. So another tactic, actually asking for referrals. This is a big one. You have to ask people for, to share, to like, to comment. And most people are pussies about this. <laughs> Don't be. As aggressive as you think you could be in the most aggressive situation that you'd ever think that you'd be willing to do that, be five times more aggressive than that. Because most people are just way too scared to ask for referrals. Uh, homework. Okay, so if you guys want to get more users for your product, simplest way to do this. Create two columns. One column, all the things you want people to do. Sharing, liking, referring, etc. Prioritize them based on what the most important ones are for you. Second column, all the things you can bribe them with. Discounts, coupons, whatever it is. Prioritize those and just start testing them. Because you don't know which, which is going to be the big one. You don't know which one's going to refer, which one's going to significantly juice up the viral coefficient of your product. You just need to test, test, test. Don't do this strategy. This is what we do. It's really hard, but, but you know, it can work in some situations. Basically, if your user experience is awesome, then people will share it on their own. This doesn't usually happen. Sometimes it can happen, but it's really too hard to get right. Build a great product, but don't, don't let your marketing strategy depend on having an awesome product. Um, in short, if you want to do the strategy right, you need to systematically identify viral content. Not, you can't create content from scratch to, and have it expect to go viral. It just almost will never happen. Your best bet is to uh, test, like, let, let, me, let me think of a way to put this. So, um, sorry, I'm talking really fast because I'm running out of time because I did exactly what I, what I said I was going to do and got too excited and went on some tangents. Um, okay, so here's a metaphor to think about when you're, when you're, when you're testing anything. Uh, nope, don't have time to go through that metaphor. Uh, <laughs> OK, I guess there is time for the Q&A. But, 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 OK, this one is good, though. All right, things that do increase the likelihood of something going viral. Things that, if, if you want to make something go viral, you need to piss people off or make them really happy. But nothing in between. You can't make them sad. People don't share sad things. They share things that make them really happy or things that make them angry. You need to be polarizing. You need people to hate you. So the most viral things are things that piss people off, make people really angry. Second most viral things are things that are happy and positive and emotional. And then you know, anything, anything that's high arousal emotions, anything that gets your blood boiling for any reason, more likely to go viral. Um, yes. <laughs> nope, no time. I have to do the Q&A. Thank you so much. So uh, to clarify a few things, because. I know a little bit about your story. You were 12 when you convinced your parents to let you drop out of school, just so get some ages out there. You are, what, 25 now? Yes. OK. Uh, you mic'd up, right? Yeah. Um, I guess uh, we'll just start from the audience here. So uh, I guess the top five vital resources, I mean, you, you, you've talked extensively about all the things you've tried to examine constantly and trying to find the best resources uh, for knowledge. Uh, is there anything about running a successful company, anything that's really resonated with you? Yes, absolutely. Study successful people and successful companies and then do what they do. Like in, in society, we have this general aversion to like doing things other people have already done, but it's wrong. That's what innovation is. I spent so much time studying innovation. And one big thing that I couldn't help but get from it is that nothing is original anyway. So progress comes from like getting it to the same level as other people, and then, and then you move past them. So take virality. When I first started studying virality, I read everything I could about the subject. And then I got to the point where, oh crap, there's no more research on it. What do I do now? And I realized, OK, well, I've got to start testing stuff. So. Uh, what, what I did was originally I, I you know, started off on Facebook, like came with, developed a series of algorithms designed to get content to go viral, created a bunch of Facebook pages that went from zero to hundreds of thousands, uh, you know, total millions of followers in a period of a few. And each of these would go viral in a period of a few hours to a few days. So uh, what we were doing effectively was pulling different levers and seeing which variables correlated positively to virality. And uh, we were conducting effectively conducting thousands of little mini experiments and. Uh, and in that process, you know, we took a lot of the same ideas over to Twitter. Um, we've been able to uh, amass millions of followers on Twitter using similar strategies. Uh, we're up to 12 million followers total across our different networks. And, uh, and also had a success on YouTube and Tumblr as well, um, currently gaining about 400,000 Twitter followers a month. What I, in this process, though, it was, you know, I, I had it got to, you, you study as much as you can, then you, then you take over from there. So, like, with, um, so let me give you an example. So like, we, have a, we have a very high success rate at launching new sites. And a big reason for that is because, <clears throat> like, for example, I'll spend a lot of time studying what other people are doing. Like Other companies I know, are really, they have really data-driven uh, websites. And so I'll watch them. When they make changes to their UI, if they keep those changes, I know they're data-driven, so they probably A-B tested it quite a bit. They kept the change, means it, it worked for them. There's a good chance that it'll work for us, as long as there's enough similarities between our UIs or our audience or whatever. These aren't even competitors of ours. And sure enough, we're basically outsourcing our customer development by doing this. 
So what I do is I'll spend a lot of time on Quantcast, Elite, uh, you know, comp uh, Alexa, Compete, etc. I'll look at sites. Oh crap! This site just started growing really fast. How did how did that happen? I'll dig in. Okay, so traffic came from Facebook, and I'll just kind of reverse engineer exactly what they did. Wayback Machine is a great resource for this. You can look to see Wayback Machine is like an archive. It takes screenshots of sites at the time. Hey, they made this one change, <coughs> and their traffic tripled when they made that change. So hey, let's try that too, see if it works for us. And usually it does because there's not, you know, most people are, are fundamentally the same. So uh, you know, like, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with lean startup methodology and the idea of customer development, you know, researching your customers and so on. The beauty of the internet is that it's just this giant sandbox of experimentation and innovation. There's thousands of people out there that are trying so many different things. They're, test they're doing the testing for you. You don't have to test it all yourself. Uh, like, like, say you want to improve the conversion rate on your, on your app or your website or whatever. You could go and test things yourself and just like look at it and guess. But there are best practices on this. If you do research on best practices for like optimizing conversion funnels and so on, they basically give you the playbook. Another example of this would be blackjack. So most people by nature just go through trial and error. They just start like digging into something like, I'll just figure it out, I'll make mistakes, I'll figure it out along the way. If you do that with blackjack, you could watch thousands of hands, thousands of hands, and still not play, uh, not play as good as you could. Or... You could go on Google, search blackjack strategy, spend one hour memorizing a chart of when to hit and when to stay. And you will be in the 99th percentile of blackjack players in one hour. And there are shortcuts everywhere. Like, you need to find those shortcuts. Don't, like, you need to outsource all this work, all this testing. Like, there's other people who have already tested it. You spend enough time studying them and what they've done, you can reverse engineer it too. So that, that's like the biggest thing is like don't duplicate someone else's work. This is what's great about the internet. We don't have to, like if somebody makes a discovery in you know, Mozambique, they can put it up on the internet and then everyone else can learn from it and we can all copy them and then we can like go on to something new. The idea of like we should all be doing independent you know, analysis and like we should all like do studies independently and so on, it's just a waste of, we're just, it's just a duplication of resources and effort. Wave the white flag of surrender here. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, we're running, running a little over on, on time. Uh, I mean, the, I guess, uh, <laughs> try. Say maybe one or two more, maybe. We'll just get them out here. So, uh, the, you mentioned the welfare queen thing. People are curious. Uh, find your welfare queen. Reagan almost, Reagan arguably won the, an election based on finding one extraordinarily viral piece of content. This is how powerful it can be. So ultimately, what is virality? Virality, art, science, music, they're all strongly linked. It's something that triggers an emotional reaction in you, right? Like if something goes viral, it means just for a large percentage of the population, it really got them to feel something, and then they wanted to go share it. So in Reagan's case, there was a story, and it was actually completely made up. Completely made up. Didn't matter. Uh, Reagan told the story, every campaign stop for the entire election, about this woman from Chicago, a black woman, who had a Cadillac, and she was on welfare. And he called her the welfare queen. And he created this narrative, this narrative about you know, like people on welfare, lazy, don't work, blah, 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 can afford Cadillacs. Not true. Didn't matter. Like Every conservative who heard that story got their blood boiling. Even, even liberals would hear that and think that's kind of ridiculous. And it didn't matter that it wasn't true. But it was super viral, like super viral coefficient through the roof viral. Everybody who heard it talked about it. Those are the ones you want to find. Those are like the diamonds in the rough. And then uh, I guess one question that we'll finish here with uh, is, People are curious. They feel like potentially you're wasting your talent on memes. I mean, so like, what? what uh, why are you currently focused on memes and you know, rage dash and other? <laughs> um, so uh, you know, what we do is totally opportunistic. You know, it's it's. I'm super blunt about that. Like we, you know, we we started off. We, I'm a pathological optimist. So we started with Gives Me Hope. We created a site where millions of people share stories. The site went viral, and we got a book deal. And I mean, we created an entire network of hope sites. Gives Me Hope, Love Gives Me Hope, Six Billion Secrets. And collectively, those sites have had over uh, half a billion page views. And, and we've received thousands of emails from people saying that the stories on those websites kept them from dropping out of school, saved their marriage, even brought them back from the verge of suicide, which is tremendously humbling and inspiring. And we saw there was opportunities. Hey, our model, our platform, it works in humor. It works in facts, like with OMG facts, et cetera. But ultimately, you know, what we're doing now isn't necessarily, we're not always going to be just doing internet memes and culture. Right now, we're just working on building up our execution abilities. We're, we're building up our resources. The beauty, when you have 10 million monthly visitors and you have 12 million followers on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, if you decide that you want to, like, you know, you know, pivot into something else, or you want to do things like Living Social. Before Living Social became a multi-billion-dollar company, Living Social had 80 million users on a bunch of Facebook apps. The reason why they blew past everyone in the market, they blew past everyone except Groupon, was because they had 80 million customers that they could market to. So we've got huge ambitions. We're moving heavily into mobile, and in many ways, we're like a, we're like an incubator. We're you know we're like a venture accelerator where we launch a new site every one to two months, and we're able to we've got we've got this huge audience. Whenever we launch a new site, we can promote it to because a lot of you guys, I'm sure you have great ideas, and one of your biggest problems is how do I get enough users? 
How do I get enough users? It's really hard to get a critical mass of people, but that's a problem we just don't have because whenever we launch a new site, we've got this massive base to, to promote it to. But ultimately, I mean, in the same way that Jimmy Wales, Jimmy Wales was a business person. He had tons of different ventures in different areas. And then he, he connected the dots between the wiki platform and, and the encyclopedia. He connected those dots and Wikipedia changed the world as we know it. And so that's kind of like you know, how I also see us evolving into. There's opportunities that exist. We're also building a cool site. So wiki is, it's like Guinness World Records meets Wikipedia. That's a tangent I won't go down. But <laughs> and long story short is like, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're constantly in a state of figuring out what we want to be when we grow up. And we're lucky you know, we've never raised venture. We've been bootstrapped, and, and so we have a lot of freedom and flexibility. But there's so many opportunities in the internet right now. There's just piles of gold sitting in corners waiting for somebody to go and scoop it up. And especially when you have the kind of resources we have, it's just a really, really fun place. And we have the kind of freedom and flexibility we have to go after opportunities because we don't have that clear, you know, you have to do this, and then you have to do this, and you have to do this. So that was a long and meandering response to say, I don't exactly know. <laughs> All right, well, Emerson Sparks, everybody. <laughs>